Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Sorry for the delays. Um, I really appreciate you all being here for this evening, for this event of the Give Me Life Festival, a celebration of Wana Lore. Yes. Uh, Vuan Alua was a person who was very adamant about keeping the core reasons of the culture that we all live and love alive and to always be critical about everything that we do in ballroom, take it serious. So tonight we decided to have like an open conversation and talk a little bit about the reproduction of power dynamics in ballroom and get to the bottom um, to see if there are any. <laughs> And if yes, what we can maybe do about them. Um, tonight, there's, so there's gonna be two panels catering to that um, topic. One is tonight, where we're gonna talk uh, about how to avoid the colonization of movements and movement. And on Sunday, we're gonna have another one about binary aesthetics. So um, we're gonna start the evening with a little interview that I recorded with a person who couldn't be present but is quite an expert on the topic and devoted all of their work to this topic. So um, have fun watching the interview and then we're gonna start the panel. Thank you so much. Yes, I consent, oh. I accept. <laughs> thank you so much, thank you for your consent. Um, thank you for your time. Um, I am super happy to have the chance to talk to you today. Um, and I think best, is for you to maybe introduce yourself and your work real quick um, for those that may not know you, although you're very notorious in ballroom and in activism in Europe. So, yes. Well, I'm happy that we finally have this conversation. Um, so my name is Habib Bitch. Uh, I am based in Paris and was born in Algiers, Algeria. I'm the Paris godmother of the house of uh, gorgeous Gucci and I walk the old way category and I just got deemed up and coming legend in the old way category by my mother, uh, Jack Mizrahi gorgeous Gucci. So um, this is my position in the ballroom scene. And I've been in this community for um, um, 10 years ish, a little less than, than 10 years. And I've been an activist for more than 12 years now and my activism is queer uh, feminist um, decolonial and all of these things together so i have tried this last few years to uh, reconciliate my activism and uh, my artistic practice which is dance which is the movement and the ballroom scene and this is why I created uh, this project that's called Decolonize the Dance Flow that you wanted to talk about. And <clears throat> it's a dance conference that, yeah, that basically creates a bridge uh, between dance and my radical politics. And I just, I did that because I feel like um, this bridge should have never been broken mm -hmm. because dance has always been political and the politics have always been danced um, in the world. So um, I realized that when I discovered ballroom like 15 years ago, because I discovered ballroom before entering ballroom. And uh, I always had this idea in mind that I would want to bring these two passions uh, of mine together. And this is this is this is what I do now. It's like I'd say 83% of my work is around decolonize the dance floor and my activism and how I talk about um, dance being political. Yes, <clears throat> which I love, which I find super interesting, um, which I think is super important and inspiring, especially that part talking about like recreating a bridge of like a gap that has been broken in some spaces. Um, maybe you can add like another two sentences about like the conference and um, how it works and how long you've been doing it, just because I think it's interesting for a lot of people. Yes. Um, so that's to me, that's still funny to this day. So this conference has been touring for five years and a half, like and literally all around the world, not even just in the Northwest, like even in the South, I've had like gigs like internationally 
which is funny to me because I'm I'm radical. I'm stamped as radical in France. Like I'm a radical um, feminist, a radical queer, a radical decolonial North African dyke, like super fucking radical. And it's just, it, it's taking me a minute to harness my anger or my angers um, and to understand that my angers were political and my angers were legit. <clears throat> Growing up as a like, Algerian um, curvy body uh, feminist um, woman, whatever the fuck this means, dyke in France. Yeah. I've always been angry. Also, I'm Algerian, so I've I was born angry. Like it's it's an angry uh, <clears throat> people, um, but it's taking me quite a minute to like harness this anger and to make it to. Um, create something out of this anger. And this is what I did with the colonizer dance law, which is a radical tool to educate people about <clears throat> what is um, queerness, what is feminism, what is uh, intersectionality, what is being decolonial and how uh, dance and the cultural world and the artist world and all of the world actually inserts itself in these systems of oppression and the systems of domination because to me there is no outside space of these um, systems of domination that are uh, racism sexism and classism just to name these three um so i i i have managed to create this tool to talk about all of these things uh, all together and to make them have a conversation because as i was saying this conversation had had been broken yes. and yeah it's just it's just me speaking for five hours <laughs> like <laughs> giving to all, all around the world about about these topics and it's crazy to me how it's been um, booked how it's been programmed and how it's been listened to in like by so many people now yeah. which makes me happy because what what's important to me is not it's not me being in front of the stage and cracking jokes about like, you know, about decolonial shit. It's about how, how the message is getting through, which is, which is amazing because it is getting through. And every, I see so many people now using the world or the, the sentence decolonize the dance floor or decolonize whatever and doing this connection that I've spent so much time trying to, trying to do. So that, that makes me genuinely super fucking happy. Yes. Um, same thing happened to me um, as you coined something that I was aware of your work and what your work was about, but not even that like that was something that you coined as a phrase, um, which is why I wanted again for you to explain real quick. So thank you again um, to share with us what your um, conference is about and congratulations also for Uh, its success. Um, as you stated, like this is very important to you. Um, uh, how I met you is through Ballroom and know that this is also a space that is very important to you. Um, so what I would like to know from your view, kind of view, is when it comes to European Ballroom culture, um, if you would uh, rather describe the space as one that successfully decolonizes and deconstructs power dynamics, Or would you rather say that the space is in danger to be colonized too, if not already so? Um, I'm gonna give a multi-leveled answer because it's a multi-leveled question. Yeah. <laughs> um, like for starters, I don't think that there is such thing as a deconstruction like I don't think that there is such thing as a final deconstruction I don't think it's a status quo I think it's a process I think it's a movement I think it's an ongoing work like we always we always have to deconstruct ourselves to deconstruct the spaces that we are in and to say that we can be deconstructed is a myth like it's an illusion And it's not helping us to, to think that we can be one day fully deconstructed or that the spaces that we navigate can be one day fully deconstruct, deconstructed. That does not exist because we live in the Northwest, yeah? So in the Northwest, there is no space that exists um, outside of the systems of oppression that are around us, that society is based upon. There is no, there is no space that exists. So of course, ballroom is 
a part of the society. So ballroom is um, crossed by these systems of oppression. So it is colonized. It has um, sexism, classism, um, fat phobia, transphobia, uh, um, uh, and all of these things that, that exist within ballroom. But ballroom was also made to get out of these systems, to escape the systems, especially racism, because as we all know, ballroom was created to like get the fuck out of the white drag queen space that was per perpetrating uh, systemic racism um, against black and brown bodies. So ballroom is an escape in itself and was political in itself from the get-go and has stayed political for a long time, the time that it was underground, that it was in, with, in the margins still. Now that it has become more like central, like it has left the margins a little bit and has become a bit more central because it has been super fucking like visibilized and mainstream, mainstreamized and uh, mediatized way more, like it's super, it's super trendy. So now we see these systems of uh, domination operating a bit more within the ballroom scene. So it's, it's just things that we have to be um, careful about. It's just things that we have to protect. Like we have to protect ballroom as a space that was made by and for um, LGBTQ plus people of color. We have to protect ballroom as a space that is um, specifically made for black people because it is a black culture. And little reminder, by the way, that there would be no culture without black culture, <laughs> that black culture is like uh, framing, culture. pop culture is framing culture, like period. Um, and we all use and benefit from black culture all of us and as a non-black person, North African but non-black person uh, that, that um, lives, uh, breathes, uh, works within ballroom, I am also aware of this, of this position. And it's, I think that it's important that we all are and that we all position ourselves um, uh, in that context. But yeah, so that, that's like a lot of things that are, um, that are, uh, that that we have to consider and that we have to think about when it comes to the construction ballroom and to what ballroom perpetuates and how we can uh, address it and protect it. Yes, one hundred percent. I agree. Um, I actually the next question I wanted to ask if you think that judge panels in European ballroom are colonized as well and. If yes, what does that do to the culture in your opinion? But I think the answer that you just gave sums it all up because it's a little bit of both. Like it's internalized things that of course exist, but like an ongoing process um, that has to happen to protect certain like values, goods and dynamics, self-healing and self-empowering dynamics that were initially ingrained in this culture. So... I would instead ask a different question because I think you already answered it. Um, and I think I would just like to know what your opinion is on the future of ballroom in Europe as it is right now, just talking about like the European scene and what the dangers are in that sense if we don't bring back that awareness of what culture is and how to be respectful with it. Um, yeah, just wanted to ask, I think like your take on that. Um, I think that as leaders, um, as people that have been in the ballroom scene for like a long time, let's say 10 years, we have a huge responsibility as as far as the future of ballroom is concerned because we have we have to protect it, as I was saying, and we have to gatekeep it. I don't think that gatekeeping is a good thing when it comes from the white cis straight bodies, but I think gatekeeping is fundamental when it comes to us and to our cultures, because if if we don't protect our cultures, nobody else is gonna do it for us. So we have, we have to gatekeep it, we have to protect it, and we have to spread the knowledge because knowledge is power, it's very cheesy, it's very basic, but it is the truth. And we can't blame 
um, the young white cis kids um, to be um, excited about ballroom, the gay kids. I'm not even talking about straight people because I can't be bothered with straight people. I don't even think that straight people exist, by the way. I think heterosexuality is an illusion. I think everybody should get out of heterosexuality. I think it's a political system that has not existed. I'm not even talking about the straight people within ballroom. Yo, I don't know what you do inside the ballroom scene. Like, why are you in the ballroom scene? But anyways, that's another question for another day. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah, but I'm talking about like the white, the white um, cis or even like the white gay queer kids. Like, I understand why they are drawn to ballroom because it's fucking fabulous it's fucking flamboyant it's so fucking powerful it's resistance resilience and beauty and power all together so i like why wouldn't you be interested in getting to a space like that and we can't blame them blame them for this the world is fucking rough so i i understand that but now that we can understand that and have this level of empathy because we grown-ups um we also have to acknowledge that we have a responsibility in giving them access to the knowledge giving them access to the history to um where it comes from how it was created who is it for like who it was it made for and who should it stay for yeah. and then like reaching them and creating bridges as you understood it's like uh, my number one passion in life is creating bridges so create this bridge so they can meet us on the other side and then we can create a, a smarter community um a better functioning community because we're not gonna we're not gonna erase them now, now it's it's a bit too late to take ballroom back from the mainstream and that's 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 what i say in my conference all the time it's a bit too late but what's not too late is making it so the right people are booked for the jobs so the right people have the career that they want to have because it's also okay to just be willing to have a career and to be fucking successful because you know that we deserve that coming from the margins we deserve that um and having the right people to to talk about um the the right subjects and just be good allies between each other um amongst each other and just just do this work this gatekeeping work this protecting work that i do in my work that you do in organizing this panel organizing this weekend and just create more opportunities to have dialogue communication to ask questions not to be a, not to be scared to ask questions because also i feel now it's kind of a time where everybody's a bit scared to ask questions that everybody feels that they should know everything when it's never the case like it's yeah. it's a process yeah. again so ask questions don't be scared to say i don't know i wish i i wish i knew more and ask the right people and have the humility um and and the yeah the benevolence and the love to to just um ask around and accept the, the process of deconstructing so we can construct a community that's that's doing better yeah. and i think that's that's the future of ballroom i think it's it is a very important moment that we're going through right now in in ballroom in europe and i think we have to seize it sorry for the interruption um i just wanted to real quick pick up on the part where um we were talking about uh what is now crucial for the european scene to make sure that um the spaces that we use especially in the terms of ballroom community um, don't fall victim to a complete colonization um, and stay a room of deconstruction and active um, resistance. Um, and you said something that I found interesting um, where you said that you think European ballroom um, is at a crucial moment and you think that we have to seize this moment. Um, and I just wanted to yeah, pick up on that, why you think that this moment right now where we're at is important and why we should seize it and how we should seize it. 
Um, yeah, I think it's a crucial, crucial moment because I think in general, Europe is going through a very polarized moment. Like politically, Europe is very polarized. So we have us that are taking way more space. When I say us, I, I mean like LGBT queer people, people of color, non-binary people, because I identify with non-binary, like even if I'm perceived as a cis woman, which is also very important in my feminism. But um, yeah, um, non-binary queer people, um, brown people, people of color, etc. we're taking more space, we're being more visible, we're being more vocal. Um, and it's important that we acknowledge that, but it's also important that we acknowledge that this creates the polarization of our political enemies that see us being more vocal and that take more space. So they also want to um, try to protect what they think that their countries should look like, that their identities should look like, you know, like this, like national identities, whatever fucking fascist bullshit that uh, Europe is like running into right now. And it is like, to me, it is a very crucial moment politically in general, and it has consequences in all of the layers of society. And as I was saying, ballroom is another part of society so it is becoming more trendy which means it is becoming more colonized it is becoming um, more mainstream more commercial but not with the right people at the center of this commercialization so this this is our job this is our job right now to keep being vocal as we have been this last like 10 to 15 years to keep um, spreading knowledge, to keep spreading the history, to keep having conversations, not to um, give it up. Because if if we give up on ballroom, then we're gonna lose it, and we don't want that. We want ballroom to say to stay, not a safe space, because there is no such thing as a safe space. It I always exist. say that. Thank space. you for saying that. Oh my god. <laughs> It doesn't exist that we can create safer, safer spaces, but there will there will always be uh, fuckeries, and that's that you know that's uh, we're humans, so yeah. But it has to stay a safer space for black and brown bodies, for um, non-normative bodies, for uh, gay bodies, for queer bodies, especially for trans bodies. Like this, this world is so fucking difficult for trans people. Like. It, we are being vocal, we are being seen, but the, the population that is the most killed and criminalized and made fun of and assaulted is trans people, especially a trans woman, especially trans women of color. So let's not forget that trans women of color created this motherfucking space that we all benefit from, that we all have fun in, that we all use, that we all um, ride so we can do Instagram posts, that we can walk balls, that we can look fucking fabulous because it was created by and for trans women of color, black trans women, Latinx trans women. So they can have a space for themselves, by themselves, to feel celebrated, to feel valorized, to feel seen, just because in the, in the rest of the world, they don't. Because in the rest of the world, they're at the very bottom of society and they create ballrooms so they, they could reverse that societal ladder. So we can't, we, we can't, we can't erase that and we can't make them fall back in the space that they try to escape from, if that makes sense, that we can't let that happen. That's, that's, that's not, no, that's not possible. And if it happens, it means that we failed. We failed our duty as allies, because I am not a trans woman, I am not, I am not black, but I am a queer person of color. And this is my number one duty is like, as I use this space, I have to protect this space. As I use this space, I have to gatekeep this space. As I use this space, I have to understand that I have to keep this space safer for the people who need it the most. And we can use the language. We can, we can, we can joke with the language, with the slang that, you know, the ballroom slang that everybody uses. Everybody can vogue. It's not a matter of, no, you're not allowed to vogue because you're white or you're not allowed to use ballroom because you're a cis white woman. Of course, it's not about legal rights. There's nobody that's gonna forbid you from doing this, but just please do it with 
with knowing your space, with knowing your spot, with knowing your history, with knowing your knowledge, with not putting yourself at the center. Everybody's always like, oh, but how can I be a good ally? Just put, don't put yourself in the center all the time. Just, just, just be careful. Listen, learn to listen, learn to deconstruct. And this is, this is what we have to do now. So ballroom stays safer for the people who need the most. And yeah, that's, that's why we have to seize this moment, which is what we're doing right now, I think. We did. I am so thankful for the time that you took. Honestly, I could talk with you for another three hours easy. <laughs> I would have no issue doing that. I'm very grateful for this exchange. I really appreciate your work, your presence in and outside this community. And um, I am pretty sure we will do something like this again in some shape or form. I'm very will. glad that um, we can share your voice um, at the panel and that people can uh, get your perspective. And maybe if you just, as a last thing, would want it to, like only if you want to, but you can add like how people can follow your work, how people can keep up with the work that you do. Um, uh, maybe you want to say that for yourself. Um, I think the best way to follow my work is actively follow my work as in not just watch it, but taking part of the work and taking part of the work is listening, deconstructing yourself, deconstructing your friends, your family, uh, your house members. And yeah, again, spreading the knowledge. I think it's, it's the best way to follow my work. Just not be just a follower, but like, be in the action i'm a very action person so yeah be in the action and the more the better perfect have, have the best panel ever i wish i could have been here but thank you for having me uh, <laughs> uh 2.0 kind of presence in the panel and have like the best conversation and i can't wait to like see what everybody has to say about this and how this conversation is gonna make us grow For sure. Thank you so much. I'm going to stop this recording right now. And I love. I talk to you soon. Um, yes. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this so far. I'm a big fan, as you can tell. Um, but I'm also a fan of um, a fan and a friend to the people that I'm about to call up on stage. So from the UK slash Barcelona. <laughs> Don't hide, baby. <laughs> Please welcome UK father JJ Revlon, the trailblazer of the UK scene. <laughs> Wherever you want. This over here. All right. Yeah, sure. Then, of course, um, the first German legend, my mother, the <laughs> European <laughs> mother, Leo St. Laurent. <laughs> And then a great honor to have you here, my friend, um, a mentor to so many people here in the European scene, Icon and founding father, Stan L. <laughs> yes, so get comfortable. I poured some water for y'all. Y'all thirsty because it's exciting. I also got some dry. Because uh, the questions, <laughs> I mean, these questions already. Um, yeah, so since I brought you on stage first, <laughs> we're just having conversation okay. among friends and community. Um, so I remember as the scene developed in London, you were a person from the beginning who was very vocal about matters of white bodies taking up space in terms of teaching, in terms of like claiming, shaping the early beginnings of this space. And um, you also received confrontation. A, a bag, no, a bag of shit. <laughs> Let's say what it is. I received a bag of shit. 
Okay. <laughs> you did. Um, and you didn't stop. Nope. You didn't stop. Um, so, um, yeah, as you you raised awareness on those matters in London early before, like, even most people in the scene knew the words that you were already using and, like, the words that now in this um, interview, for example, are more common for, like, people to know what it means. Um, what I would like to know from your perspective is would you describe the European ballroom floors as colonized, given the mechanics described by a bitch? Um... Yeah, I feel like so between UK just for like uh context. So uh when I started in the scene, there wasn't really anything happening that was like specifically like ballroom. It was like ballroom inspired by Am I wrong, Sydney? Huh? Yeah, like vulgar inspired by. It was like um a thing that uh Uh, there was a thing that kind of like exists because people were excited by it. Like, so I'm not like the first, I'm the most continuous. People say trailblazer, I say pioneering trailblazer. So, joking. <laughs> so, <laughs> so for like in the UK, what kind of happened is this, um, yeah, it kind of was like colonized. I got told shit like, when I told you about bag of shit, like I got, I came in after Paris, after I saw the scene in Paris through Vinny's eyes kind of thing. That's when like, I got like hit by a bus and was like, bitch, you need to come back and do it like this kind of thing. Like how you see it on YouTube. And because that wasn't happening. But what I felt like is the whole Inspire by situation was getting merged to be like, this is what Borum is supposed to look like. We're like, we're all supposed to be kumbaya, sitting in a circle, like having, you know, drinking tea, you know, like I was going to say something else, but I watched too much Housewives. So it's like it was supposed to be like this and this is not really it and this is where i feel like the kind of colonizing came into it and it always comes into it with new countries new people find about the scene new people want to learn but it's usually a lot of white people that especially white women that come into the scene because they I don't know, like, for example, they could have taken uh, Georgina's workshop, or Stan's workshop, or Archie's workshop, or my workshop, and then they go back to their country where there's, like, really no one, right? But a whole bug of LGBT people, and they say, oh, I'm going to start something. So this is what happened in Spain. So I live in Barcelona. So when I went to Barcelona, there was already, like, this kind of scene existed, but it wasn't really, like, boring. Again, it was inspired by and it was a white woman who was at the forefront but super problematic so when i moved there it was kind of like jj please help us and i was like no um <laughs> to tell the truth like i went to spain to live not to do this all over again but you know after uh after a year and you know find out that the kids go like vogue in like the streets and stuff like this like that wasn't comfortable for me especially when i had like i found access to a studio and now we actually have like a really working scene that comes from them i facilitate but i feel like where colonizing comes into it is when someone doesn't want to facilitate like someone said maybe it's the panel that i saw with stan in finland but someone said like be the vessel for the scene like it's not about you where colonizing comes into like when you center yourself at the forefront and you say this is the idea i have because you know i watched the youtube video from biggie c in 1976 when everyone was about the peer walking face which is like no like you have to work every city has their own shit and every city has their own thing why boring needs to exist but the face value is is like i do agree with her uh habibi pitch Because she also came to Barcelona and heard about... Let me tell this story. She also heard about this... There's two girls, like... One is kind of, like, non-existent anymore, but there's still, like, this other girl who teaches voguing, inspired by, classes in Barcelona. And when Habibi bitch caught wind, like, the slightest of breeze about it, <laughs> literally what happened was is that we used the same studio and then... <laughs> Jesus... When she says she's radical, she fucking means it. Like, like I was sitting at the back. When she was like, I'm super radical, I was like, I've been there. I've seen it. So basically what happened is, is that, um, it's a bit silly. I was looking for a print I ordered on Amazon. And then I went into the room to try and look for it. I closed the door. 
Habibi bitch is like, I didn't even see her. Like, I turned around. She's opened the door and, like, screamed at this girl and been like, what you're doing is wrong. You're centering yourself at ballroom. They started from black trans body. All of you, like, everyone in the class, all of you are wrong for taking this class. She wasn't wrong. Next day, I got hella phone calls from the studio manager being like, she was crying, blah, 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 blah. But do you see what happened? This is that not this girl could understand what she was doing was wrong. She turned around and was like, oh, I'm I'm colonized because I'm a, like, she was like, I'm colonized. I'm colonized. Or I'm, I'm a minority because I'm a white woman in Russia. Something like this. Like, she made it, like, about her. Sense yourself is not the way okay Amen. be the vessel and yeah colonizing will always exist it's just about how you approach it and sometimes you know what people don't like to do is take an l from a job because it pays money and they get rent has to be paid but for me like if i feel like someone's just used my body to like center themselves and like take over my scene or have a big say about what my what i'm what about the community and what it's here to give i just kind of say fuck that really and not a lot of people do that but yeah i think one by one people will get bored <laughs> and maybe one day in life colonizing will stop amen <laughs> 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 thank you so much also for sharing the story because i never heard the story before it's worth a clap thank you <laughs> um yeah, what you described also touches on, of course, the fact that the European demographics are very different than from the space that ballroom comes from. Um, our demographics, for example, in Germany, um, compared to even the UK or compared to Paris, are very different um, when it comes to race. Um, so, Georgina, um, as you were also a person that had to start from scratch. Um, how do you see the situation in Germany now? Um, and yes, there's obviously different intersections, like for example, um, there's different intersections for the question I'm about to ask, like for example, a, a POC femme queen versus a white femme queen, or um, a white beginners versus POC beginners, or white woman in performance versus black woman in performance, or black woman in performance versus POC woman in performance, because there's levels to all of these things in the way that you're being perceived. Um, white organizers versus black organizers, like all of these things. Um, what I want to know is your opinion on who do you think receives the most recognition in Germany, in your country, because you have like a very broad overview of the situation like years and years more years than anyone else here and do you think race is a factor of success in ballroom yeah no um thank you for the question <laughs> uh layers layers yeah layers to it so i feel like um in Germany, a lot of uh, the scene is very young. So I would say at this moment after COVID, yeah, most of the people in the scene are what, between 17 and 23 to five is already kind of old. Yeah, so me <laughs> being one of the oldest <laughs> in Germany, in Germany. <laughs> um, yeah, I feel like I can see that there's a lot of um, excitement about what happens on the floor. Obviously, there's, there's ballroom also, but I feel like uh, there's a lot of people falling through the margins that do a lot of work behind the scene. Usually it's black bodies <laughs> in Germany uh, that do the work, but they fall like flat behind the scenes because they might not be as self-centered as other white counterparts, so to say, right? So I think the way that people present themselves, especially people that do the work behind the scene, we're not as self-centered, you know? So sometimes I also think maybe I just got to be more self-centered. <laughs> but then I'm getting like, no, no, that's not the solution. I don't want to become that self-centered person. You know, I would prefer that people can realize when a person is really just self-centered and they just scream, me, me, me. Like Archie always says this, <laughs> it's the opera. Me, 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 me. Yeah. So I feel like a lot of people are on this me opera and a lot of young kids fall for this image and they're like, yeah, this person is so great. They did so much. But did they really do that much? 
Like, was the ball that they throw that fab? Was the panel that fab? Was the organization that fab? Or was it just big? Right? Like, was the, not for real, like, was the stage cute or was it just big? <laughs> you know? <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, yeah, is it a really fierce commercial event or is it just a commercial event that is big, you know? Like, so I feel like, the, the quality of the events, at least as I feel for my work, that I feel like our house, and especially also you for building the house and the scene with me, right? Because she's been in there for eight years, yes, in the scene. Yeah, so this work is not only done by me, I think that's also important to say. Zoe is one of the people for Germany, so three black women, like um, really doing a lot of work. Uh, and still I don't feel like we get the roses, like people look at other people like, you know, but that's okay, because I'm still gonna be here. Still gonna pump that runway. <laughs> Might come back for women's performance, watch out. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, thank you so much for that insight. And these clear words. Um, yeah, but like also to talk a little bit more about like how it looks on the floor, because we were talking now about how it looks on the floor. I would like to address the next question to you. Um, since you're a person who knows the European scene very well, while you yourself were brought up in the original scene, and you are still in the original scene, so I feel like you have like an overview, and also besides Germany, like you've just been to a lot of countries and you know the different situations, the uh, uh, obstacles that people in different countries had to go through and are still going through to build. And I would like to know what you observed when it comes to confidence or the lack thereof that you see like what i mean is do you see a difference in how black and brown bodies carry themselves in places where they are the minority which is here in europe versus to how they carry themselves when the majority of them are not white how it is in the us like do you think the factor race makes a different for black and brown bodies here in Europe on how confident they step onto the floor? Um. <laughs> I think that um, it varies um, where you are, where the integrity lies in that specific scene, because I've seen situations where people really respect the history origin of ballroom um and if there are a lot of white men on the judges panel and a black body presents itself a lot of times they will show privilege to the black body because they honor history origin Yeah, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, because they honor the the history, and then there are other places who they don't so much honor the history. So when you see black bodies on the floor, maybe the um, the confidence may not be as high because they don't feel comfortable. You know, um, they don't feel welcome because I think when a lot of especially people of color come into ballroom, they know immediately that this is supposed to be a, a place for them originally. And so when they don't get that praise or that, that respect there, you know, it's like, what's going on? You know? <laughs> like what's happening here, you know? Um, so I think it's, it's a matter of where you are and the integrity that's being put into that specific scene. Um, following, I would like to know if we talk about black and brown bodies like ourselves and what we uphold. Do you all think, uh, this question goes to everyone, but I would like to hear your question first. And this is like a general question for ballroom, but like, not just Europe. Um, do, you, do you feel that there is or has been any internalized racism as well from black and brown bodies? 
um, that also needs to be addressed in terms of like, who do we uphold? Who do we praise? Who do we support? Like, um, do we support uh, light skinned people over dark skinned people? Do we support um, people with pretty privilege over other people? Do we like internalize things? Do you think um, white gays aside, like there's something that we also need to work on? Like, I mean, as, you, as I'm phrasing the question, you can say what I think, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I want to know what you think. Yeah, I think that we all have privilege. Like, we all do, of course. Keeping it real, people of color, we have the least amount of privilege always it's it's just like that um but we all have privilege and we all need to constantly be checking ourselves on a regular basis you know me as a man i have privilege you know i'm a gay black man but i have privilege you know and i constantly have to check myself on a regular basis um if you can't, if you don't have the ability to look within yourself and to check yourself, then you are the problem. Amen to that. Um, that just brings me back to the um, to the girl that you was talking about when you were talking about colonization. She was like, "Yeah, but I'm a white woman, but I also ha don't have it easy <laughs> in life and stuff." So. Um, it just brings me back something that I want to share just because it just pops up into my mind. And as you can see, I'm a fangirl of certain people in activism. And there's a person called Janaya Khan, and they once held um, a beautiful speech about privilege and to rethink of like, because in these discourses that we are having, all of us are looking for why we are also marginalized and what is also, why we also have it hard. And it's like, it becomes like, almost like a battle in certain spaces where it's like, but I have it hard because this and this happened. And, but look at this trauma that I bring to the table. What are you going to say to that? Like all of that stuff, like it happens and it's a dynamic that no, nothing can grow from that dynamic, like nothing. And I just wanted to share with you, maybe I'll post it tomorrow, the link to that speech, because they said something very important in terms of like privilege is what you did not have to go through. So for everyone like to think of privilege of something that you don't have to go through, like are you a neurotypical person? Are you able-bodied? Like what are the like what do you not have to go through? And then to focus on that instead of like this is difficult for me because of my identity, such and such and such, uh, which doesn't mean to like patronize everyone's traumas and emotions, which are valid, but also to not lose the ability um, that Stan was just talking about because then you become the problem um but yeah i want to hear uh your opinions on that uh too in terms like the do you think there's like internalized things that we need to tackle jj you ready to say something Not really but i will um okay um, <laughs> um i definitely think there's a lot of internalized shit i always feel like we feel like we can uh, do our own people harder than others. I think that like, we feel like we can just get away with it. You know, I have a thing like, you know, everyone watches, if you put your hands up, you watch Housewives. Oh, Wait, put your hands up if you watch the Housewives franchise. If you watch Atlanta, put your hands up. Big thing for me. Why are lying? Big thing for me. I can't watch black women argue. Honest to God, I watch New York. Sydney, Melbourne. I used to be on the basketball wives. The but oh, <laughs> let me put that on on hey you. But for me, I feel like we we can we will always do our own like worse than we would do others. Like that is a thing. And yes, like son's correct. Like there's so many privileges, and you're right in terms of like um, like if you're able bodies and X Y Z. Because people do only focus on like the hardship and that internally is also awful because I feel like black girl black well it's always I also she her everyone. But all the black girls in the room, right, we all grow up in a certain way. You can't do this, you shouldn't do that. Like, you know, you never you know, everyone well, it's not a rule for everyone, but like 
you leave your house beige your skin, cream your skin all the time. Like, but uh, you know, you know, you can't eat this. You ain't going out with a friend today. You know, go do your homework. Like, you know, there's all these things that like align us together. But we always will find what makes us different, and that is easier on a panel situation because I will talk about it. I definitely think there is a very much, um, and I saw this a lot in the US, in my opinion, where if you wasn't black, it people were living for you 10 times harder than like their own. Like, it's like, I walk in Vogue Femme. I'm Karen, bitch. I'm flicking. I'm jumping off the table. What the fuck a bitch gonna do? Like, fucking fall from the ceiling and break a hole through the ground? Like, what the, like, I don't get it. It's true, but then when you're not like of color, like the girls are carrying, like you know, I you know my tens were five, no shame. Shout out Amani, my shit here. But I saw like my tens to be like the hardest thing, like the party was so hard on us compared to like two other girls who really didn't do much, you know, a roly poly and a dip, like you know, like it's the truth. Y'all can watch the clip. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell the, the truth. Camp. If we're going to have this private discussion, ciao. <laughs> okay? So, it's the truth. Like, I do definitely see that a lot, you know. I've seen, like, face categories where uh, a girl not of color still had, like, paint from the previous two categories on her face, but the girl of color lost. You could see that girl's face just colored in, like, blue or green or some shit. Like... <laughs> It didn't make sense. And I feel like there's a lot of that. There is a lot of that. And that's the truth. Like, we have to do better in terms of, like, um, when we sit, when you sit on a panel, number one, like, that is a privilege, number one. Number two, you're judging for what you see right there and then. There are clear rules that have had this history in a chokehold for many years, right? In terms of, you know, realness as a category and then how do you open it up to people who are general conforming? Like, the scene has been in a chokehold of history for so many years and thank god things are changing because i know your categories are carrying um but this history has lasted so many years and i just feel like people feel like they can just not do any like they don't have to do that and you know yeah again when you're a person of color you come up to the stage like i'm judging just for this i'm not judging you harder like we already have hardship as it is as people of color why the fuck in a scene where we're supposed to be like this is supposed to be joyful, okay? <laughs> and fun, someone told me once upon a time. <laughs> like, we have this, like, super hardship. And then also, we're also hard against each other, you know? Even when the category is clear. I said this in a conversation, I think, when we were talking in Finland. It's like, you know, on one Kiki function in the U.S. called for... I don't know why all my, my examples are U.S. I can do U.K. But in the U.S., there was a category on the Kiki function that said... It was call out. So you have to put someone's name on your T-shirt and then that person took huge offense to it. I saw this shit on TikTok. They took huge offense to it and they went on to like slewing, like oh, slewing is like cussing this person out uh, on, social, on social media being like, your Vogue is shit, your dish, your dad, your dish, your dad, your dish. And then it's just like, bitch, read the fucking category. Like everyone gets like too up in their asshole about like things that are just supposed to be fun. And again, people of color we are harder on each other because i feel like if a girl who's not of color did the same thing called that the same person it would not have the same vim at all so jump in yeah i think that has a lot and and now i always speak about this all the time um it is so important that when y'all are having balls and organizing and picking the judges it is such an important part of your event. Like sometimes I can't understand that like I can I can look out into the ballroom scene and see who fair judges are, who logical, cognizant judges are. And we have a lot of them. But for some reason <laughs> the same girlfriend. <laughs> We put these people on the panel who can't be consistent, who have gripes, you know, and that's, that's a big part of that problem is you have to be consistent. If I'm judging, and judging is hard, you know, it's really hard, um, but you have to be consistent. So if the first person came out 
and they did the bare minimal, but they fit the requirements of the category and they got a 10, you have to judge everybody else who comes after them the same thing, no matter what color they are. A lot of times though, and I'm gonna be really honest, okay? <laughs> what people people of color, right? And and there are loopholes in this, okay? But people of color, like we are we are raised in rhythm. Don't cancel me. <laughs> well, we are raised in rhythm, like from the door. Okay? So a lot of times and and I've noticed this, like i I'm, I'm not a trained dancer. I've had like three ballet classes in my life. Um, and a lot of times when I'm teaching, I get a lot of questions like, oh, is the beat on the the, the, the <laughs> one, on the four and the A or the five and it is? And I'm like, girl, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> I'm just hitting it. Oh, yeah. Because, because I honest, we, from the door, like, yeah, like I'm, I'm, you're raised in the rhythm, and I see that sometimes there are challenges when, when, it, when it comes to. <laughs> Say it when it comes to non-black people, right? And that's okay, right? Um, because it's it's really weird, also because like. I was raised in rhythm, but it when it comes to choreography, that is rocket science for me. So so I get both sides, but um I lost my train of thought. <laughs> um Yeah, so okay, so when you when you get a person like a white person comes on the floor and they have some type of rhythm, a lot of times People, especially you'll see this in the US, like they're rooting for them. God. Like, yes, bitch, come on. Like, yes, somebody got it. Like, you know. Um, but you have, again, you have to be consistent because if you're giving them that same energy when there is a person of color that comes on a floor, because there's there are people of color who don't have they don't have it together. <laughs> And you'd be like, girl, where were you at? <laughs> you know. But you have to keep the same energy. You know, you yeah. have to you Yeah, it yeah. has to be fluid. Exactly. You know. I wanna um since we're talking I wanted to add something on the question uh, about um how um uh, yeah, we also have to check ourselves because I feel like I also feel like we have like internalized hate against ourselves, obviously. Um, but also, how does that translate when we look at people that look like us, right? So I feel like that's something we really underestimate. And I feel this even on European channels. For America, it makes a bit more sense to me because they're like, oh my God, excuse my maybe ignorant sounding English. But there's this white girl from Europe and she's turning it, right? So that's like a thing that people can get excited for because it's something that might not happen naturally in the US, you know, because Sabrina from. Living on Fifth Avenue might not jump into a ball and turn it. But Sabrina from Koenig's Allee down here, she might turn it, right? <laughs> she might. She might. <laughs> she might. That's why I excuse this. But um, what I wanted to say is that I do um, also see this on judge panels here where there are people of color, especially trans or non-binary people of color, black people of color, especially dark-skinned people of color, other body types that are not skinny, um, that they don't get the same love for like 90% of the people that walking look the same in Europe. And, it's more, and that's okay, because we're in Europe. So I'm not judging that. But I'm just saying that's the fact. So if I walk women's, I might be the only black girl walking. And that alone uh, will see that the aesthetic, your eye is trained to see the 90%, to appreciate the 90%. And when the 1% comes in, it's like, I don't know if I can understand this, maybe. Do I like it? Plus, like, also the age, I feel like there's a very tendency to 
liking seeing a young girl being very sexual, but when it comes to a grown woman, expressing her sexuality is not that appreciated. <laughs> not as much. <laughs> you know, we, so we've been there, done that. Add that woman to be a gay woman. Yes, that on top. And to not like have that like male gaze aesthetic. Um, but yeah, I don't want to... I don't want to go off track too much. <laughs> so also in Europe, we need to check ourselves. And I'm also talking about the, the black people in the scene to really make sure what are you judging for because you are setting the tone. Because um, there are people looking up to you, looking up to us. So we are setting the tone for what other people will judge. Also, stop complaining, okay? If you black in the scene and you say, I'm not going to join the scene because it's so white. What the fuck do you expect to happen? It's <laughs> gonna keep white, okay? So that's a big thing where you were talking about like that privilege of being like, if I'm the black person in the scene, no one else must come. It's a very big thing. And that like to say, it, yeah, bluntly like, shut up. <laughs> I like join the scene and like tell your friends to tell your friends and stop looking at it from this gaze of like, Look, I grew up in a, in a scene where I was privileged to go to black gay nights like from 15, 16, all the way up to like now the club still exists, right? But that's not what the scene, like Paris is different from the UK because of that. Like we have those spaces and have for time. Most of y'all come to Carnival and Bootylicious every last month and all this other shit that goes on there, right? It's the truth, right? So when it comes to the Borum scene, people always, like black people, people of color, it's always some sort of complaint about not enough this and not enough that. It is on you. Same like how it's on me and us, you know? It's not on, it's not, it's on you to bring your bitches into the scene. Okay? That's it, sorry. <laughs> Merci beaucoup. No, thanks for saying it. I mean, somebody had to say it. Um... I want to I want to stay with the judging part for a second because I found that very interesting when you opened up that topic and um when I ask you again like if um do you think the way that people judge in a sense of like what they live for like what they really live for like especially in performance categories but also in face like in general like do you think um, it has changed throughout like the last decade or do you think it has and if yes in what direction like um, yeah in, in, in a sense of like what was the original aesthetic or what did we like or what did we, what did we used to like because like yeah that <laughs> <laughs> yeah so judging uh, I, I feel it's individual and um, you have to learn to take a step back when you're doing that because we all have things that we like personally but as a judge you have to take a step back from what you like personally and look at what's in front of you that's that's number one I think the aesthetic that we used to like maybe when I joined the ballroom in 1990 I mean I was I was not raised differently but because I think there were other people who were raised like this, but I was always taught to be open. And so I think maybe in the 90s, like for a category like face, you know, it was a typical European features. I think that has changed, um, but it's individual because some people, like I was on a panel recently and people just have these ideas in their head. Oh, this is what you must do, or this is what how you must present something. And it's like, no, you really have to take a step back and look at what's in front of you and judge it accordingly. You can't go on your personal things. You have to judge on in the moment. And not all judges are able to do that. People want to judge, you know, um, I don't mind judging. I like it because it's the best seat in the house, and I love, I love watching, I love watching talent. But with the egos that they have on the floor today, a, a lot of times I don't get crazy hype about it because it's supposed to be 
fun. It's supposed to be something you can enjoy, but people real they really get in their feelings about a lot of things. But um, yeah, you sh- you should be able to step back and look at what's in front of you, understand the foundation of these categories, and judge it accordingly. And I just think a lot of people don't. They have all these misconceptions in their head. Um, thank you so much for that. Hot to be said. And it's different if it's coming from you, for the European scene, 100%. Um, Georgina, um, what do you think future generations of ballroom can do better than us in terms of decolonizing dance floors? And what is your advice in that regard if you look at successes and mistakes of first-generation leaders in Europe? Yeah. <laughs> wow, there have been so many mistakes. No? <laughs> it's true, though, because we learned from scratch. So, yeah, we did a lot of mistakes. And there's a lot of things that we learned from mistakes and from people being like, hey. And we're like, no, that's not what I wanted to do. But if this is what the impression is, what you perceive, then I need to change what I do because that's not my intention. Like for my house at the beginning, the house of Melody back then, like they were like, oh, the cis woman house. So that was never my intention. I never wanted a. But then I looked at our house. I'm like, okay, we have one butch queen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Right? So I feel like sometimes you have to be able to reflect and also understand why certain things, yeah are perceived even if that's not your intention. I feel like people get very hurt because they're like, that was not my intention. Yeah, um, but still the mistake happened. Still things are going wrong. People don't feel welcome, people don't feel seen. So we need to like change, really change, change things. So I feel like being open of um, being able to accept that you will also make mistakes, that you also are probably being very ignorant towards somebody Maybe it's somebody in the scene that is not that hot. It's not one of the hot girls, yeah? It's not one of the cute girls, so you don't, you don't see that person. But that person is around for every function. That person is around in every backstage asking everybody if they need help. That person is offering workshops for free. That person is the first person to be like, I want to do this. But who do you see? The person with the six pack that you want to go home with. All right. So let's just put some priorities also in, in, in which is fine, which is fine, boo-boo. That's fine, too. I'm just saying there should be a balance because there's people putting in the work and they're not being seen. And when these people leave the scene, who's going to do the work? Not the six-pack. I doubt it. Ironically. Ironically. But also, but also, but, but also, is it a is is it a mistake that you have the cisgendered house? Because again, if those are the people who were there who were doing the work, no, it's not a mistake. But it was not my mission. It's not like I stepped into the ballroom and said mission. I want to be a cisgendered house. Yeah. So I feel like I wanted to have a ballroom house. I wanted to have a house that could that other people, like queer people, trans people, can join and like I can offer them a space because I was there. I was the first one. So I'm like, okay. This is what I can do to, to nourish something. But if it doesn't read to my vision, then yeah, I'm going to change that. that, for me at least. Because I didn't want this to be a cisgender woman house. So I'm like, then I need to definitely change, and I need to look at who I add to my house, who do I approach. You know, people are like, oh, this other situation, mistakes again, and realizing who we are, who we put in our houses, who we put on our panels, who we teach for workshops, who we actually acknowledge on Instagram, who we hype uh, on Instagram, especially nowadays, like that needs to be really be on check because it's important and it counts. So if you want to make it count, you need to look at yourself. And for me, it was looking at my house and being like, what do we have and what not? So if there's a luscious body looking at my house, will they feel welcome? Most probably not. You know, so my other people might think, oh, it's just a skinny house. No, but that's how the fact of it, and I'm, you know, so I'm just saying that's how I operate. Also, for how the, I w- would like to continue building the scene is looking at things that people might say is a negative, and then reevaluate and be like, is that really what I want? No, then I have to change uh, the way I do things because I'm not doing this on purpose, and I'm not doing it because yeah. But this is I don't even feel offended. I'm fine, and I am a cis woman. So. <laughs> 
Um, <laughs> Uh, I just want to add to this uh, because I always have something to say. Um, so also, I think to add to what like you're saying, like I understand where you come, your, where your point of view comes from. Where you're like re-looking at your house, people see an uh, issue and or see something that could be an issue or whatever the case may be, and you start to change it. But I feel like <laughs> it comes to shade. I, mean, <laughs> I feel like honing in on someone like. Um, like someone who's like a leader of your scene, it's kind of, it's like, I feel like that's a dumb position to have when there's more problems that have happened in the scene. Cause I feel like in different scenes, there's obviously a lot of issues, but we also like to, I think the new generation needs to have a mouth and stop looking at like, first you want to look at, well, first you want to look at, I'm going to use this as an example. This is basically to Germany. So first you want to look at Jin and go, why did, or so from, why did you not say something when this, this, and this didn't happen, but you also have a mouth. So I think the new generation need to learn how to use their mouth. <laughs> Big time. And also to follow up on what you say, because it's all good, like, what I love about, like, Stan being here is that, and you said it, it's like, when it comes from you, it's different, you know? You're someone who's been in the scene from the 90s, so the, 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 I don't know, when you open your mouth and you say something, it's like gospel. But anytime it's uh, someone else or someone in the scene who's a 007 who has opinion, it always gets shut down. But what you lot need to learn is in your new generation is that you need to listen to each other. And if there's a problem, someone brings you a problem, take that shit as Georgina would and reflect and look at yourself. Don't just be like, no, because of this and no, because of that. You really do have to look at yourself, you know? When I put four people on the panel <laughs> at my first ball and Maria had to be the DJ, I learned from that that I would never work with the person I did ever again and that it had to be an odd number. But somehow, when there's stuff that happens, right, <laughs> can you imagine? And the final part was like Kendall and someone else. And I was like, the crowd decide. Anyway, <laughs> you know, you learn from these things, but like when stuff happens within your, trust me. <laughs> down so um but the thing is i looked to someone who i thought knew what they were talking about but they obviously didn't no names mentioned so <laughs> when it comes to like your like especially like younger generation when it comes to like issues within your scene you definitely need to if you see some shit you should call it out you have a voice as much as anybody else you shouldn't just point your finger to like one of us or anyone else to say something for you because you have a mouth I don't feel like because you're a double O or you're not on the house or you ain't been in it for like 10 years. Some of you do need to be quiet, but some of you who really, it's true, but some of you really do have stuff to say and you should really talk about it. You should really have that conversation and hold people accountable for certain situations. Mainly I'm talking to the Germans because I know a lot of shit. This is like my second home. So I know a lot of shit that's happened and I feel like you definitely point your finger too hard over here where you should really, you know when you point your finger, three fingers point back at you. I always say that. I love that, <laughs> you know? And it's true, like you do and you wait for someone like Stan to come to give you this gospel that the girls have been trying to say to you for time because all you keep doing is looking at someone's house as like just this. You can question everything under the sun about these people but you really do have to like look at yourself and when and i know half of the problematic shit that's happened here and no one has said anything you just look at others to do that job for you it's not on anybody else to do it for you you have to do it for yourself how the hell do you expect to build a legacy for yourself or even write any sort of crayon in the corner of a book of some of history where you can't even open your mouth Thank you so much. Like, really, really, thank yeah, you. Yeah, I just had to get out. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. That means a lot to me. I'm really touched, but I'm not going to cry just now. I'm going to reserve <laughs> that for Sunday. <laughs> okay, <babe. laughs> we still got a few days. Um, but touching on that, I also just want to um, encourage and remind that, like, um, everyone, and I think that's a misconception, it doesn't just count for ballroom. Counts every space that you touch, every club that you go to, every festival that you go to, every city you live in, every country you live in, everyone is responsible for a space to be great. Like, 
all of us here are responsible for how this evening goes. I can make, I can think of a million things to do or not to do to create something, but all of us are equally responsible. And it will be the same for me when I'm not on stage and I'm like entering a space. You have a, all of us always have a responsibility. And it's a very basic and human thing that we, that got lost in long times of like, a new capitalist world or whatever, but like the principle of solidarity of us to be, we are responsible for each other. And it is also important to learn how to have boundaries and stuff. But I've also feel like that sometimes this, these words are just being thrown to be like, Oh, this, this, not me, this, not me, this, not me. All of like, it's never just you. It is never just you. So, um, yeah, just wanted to like encourage for all of us to think like, because also from my, um, from my, I'm, I'm not talking to be like, duh, 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 duh. I'm talking from, I've been a self-loathing asshole for a long time. Like I've been like, oh my God, nobody understands. Like I, I know that feeling and I've lived there 100%. And it's a very lonely place. Like it's a very lonely place. And I just want to like, encouraged because I felt it when I snapped out of it to remember that like all of us there's power in that to remember that we're like all responsible because if I'm responsible for something I remember that I also have power to create something so I just wanted to get that out um unfortunately our time is running out this was very beautiful I just before we stop um yeah, first also wanted to let you know that after this, um, there's going to be a beautiful show called Omelette du Fromage by beautiful artist Nicole M. Picot. Um, I'm not sure when exactly she's going to come on, but it's going to be after. Um, so if you linger around and want to talk a little bit more to be mindful also of the show, you know, that there's like respect the artists on stage. Um, yeah, but before we say goodbye for tonight, I uh, wanted to ask you again, um, all of you real quick, um, what are your biggest fears and your biggest hopes as well for European ballroom scene in terms of like chances that we have and how we could do great or how we might not if we're not careful? Hey, I'll go first. Here's everyone turn their head to me. Uh, yeah. Negative. So, I wait. Hold on a sec. What's the negative one again? What's the fears? So, my fears mm -hmm, are that we become a scene that are complicit to everything that we shouldn't be. Uh, people abusing power. Uh, you know. It's happened assault at balls or someone being put down or transphobia or, you know, anything like this. These are my fears that this will grow in the scene because it really is kind of growing in the scene and people are really not saying anything. Um, that's my fears is that everyone will keep their mouths. What well, I feel like silence is violence and it's not like Meghan Markle, like you're silenced. Okay. Yeah. Like, silence is violence and I really believe that. And I feel like I'm hoping that the scene doesn't go into a way where everyone's super silent about shit that happens either to them or to somebody else. Um, in the second breath, I'm also fearful that people are going to be too loud <laughs> for nothing, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Equally that, like, you know, those two things really fear me most um, and that boring won't exist, but that ain't happening anytime soon. Um, the, fa the positive now, hopes. I hope for our scene to be unified. Do you know how hard it is to go from one ball to another when they're in the same hour <laughs> <laughs> of each other and different countries? Okay? <laughs> Can we look at the calendar? You know? <laughs> like, you know, I'm really, like, happy that the scene has grown to so many countries, you know? And, you know, I, I've been around for a while, but, like, yeah, I just hope that we can get our calendars correct <laughs> okay and that we can aim and that we are all able to just aside i don't hope that we are all able to like travel together to different scenes and like see each other like it's so nice to see like 
cheering in the back. Make some noise for him in the back. Paris Born TV. <laughs> I haven't seen you in years. But it's so good to be able to see, like, she was here and I also saw him in Amsterdam. It's also good to see Typhoon here and I also saw him in Amsterdam. It's so good to see Stan in Finland and then see Stan here. Sid in the US, well, London, US, and then see them here. Like, I hope that we can keep doing this thing of, like, traveling and, like, you know, being books and blessed and all those things and making more conversations like this, like with Habibi Bitch and, yeah, even being more radical. Habibi Habi Bitch, sorry. I always say that. I always say more BBs <laughs> on the end. <laughs> I do. And, yeah, I just hope that we can do more of, like, these kind of conversations. Even, like, kitchen table. Like, it doesn't always have to be, like, a panel, you know, like kitchen table, having like real discussions and actually listening to each other. Oh my God. I think like my biggest fear when it comes to the art of ballroom and what is presented on the floor is that it gets super watered down, that the actual detail, the, the craftsmanship, the time, the effort, the detail, um, in this culture gets lost. Because, yeah, I see a lot of people like going for the flamboyant big movements, but like the details is what I love about ballroom. And like the minute of understanding what shade can be. It doesn't have to be like super dramatic. It can be like precise, uh, communicate very clear. So I hope that we still understand what we're doing on this floor in the future, <laughs> uh, that that doesn't get lost. Um, I hope that um, we can learn, yeah, to communicate better what you said. I feel like, um, hope to c uh, communicate better in person. Because I feel like, yeah, we say be loud, be loud. But for me, that doesn't mean like Instagram post. Because for me, that's also like death of communication. Uh, like in general, in this world. <laughs> yeah, because people don't really talk to each other. Like I can read into a message a total different way. Like I can say like, I'm sad. I can be like, I'm sad. Yeah, it will like give a different vibe to how it's perceived. So depending on how I read something, what my mood is, like a simple message can be understood as like the insult of my life. Yeah, so this I really hope we learn how to talk, um, to talk. So if there's a problem not to like read on Instagram, then I have to call to make an appointment that these two people meet to call and then they meet maybe, yeah? But like to be like, hey, I need to talk to you or to reach out to somebody and be like, I have a problem, I don't know how I can approach this person, versus like, yeah, we need to learn how to talk. Like, even in Germany, we're like in the same country, guys. So I would wish that, because I love uh, seeing the German community after 10 years, the new kids coming in, like this is a point where I can be like, ballroom is, is here, how Yana would say. <laughs> um, whereas before we were just a group of people like voguing or people like inspired by, right? So I'm, I feel like, Leah, let's take this serious now that we're here. Now that you are here. Now that the scene is here, actually. Now that the people is here, let's, let's really appreciate this. I hope that um, Ballroom can be an example for the rest of the world because that's, when I look at Ballroom, that's what it is to me. Um, it's everybody who is discriminated against, everybody who is put down, put in this place. And although there's a lot of drama in ballroom, I think that the rest of the world should strive to be what ballroom is. Um, so I hope that we can get there one day. Um, and I wish for the integrity and the essence of ballroom to remain true always. Um, I believe in evolution, but I also believe in foundation. That one hit. That one. Um, and this was created specifically for a purpose. It is a very political movement, even though it is fun, you know, it is fun. It is for us to breathe, for us to express, but um, very specific. So essence, 
foundation, yes, evolution, but the evolution must match the foundation. And I also wish for simplicity because I think a lot of times we overcomplicate everything. Hey. Yes, you. Uh, I think my fears align very much with yours, Georgina, uh, in terms of the details of this culture. Um, and I know it's hard to grasp and understand if if you don't have like an active interest in um, what this culture means on a broader spectrum than just like voguing at a ball but also like where does this culture come from what does it how how was living in the 80s in the US as a black person what is black culture why is there a black history like like to get like a deeper understanding um i think and like an, you need to have an interest for that of course and like if you gain a deeper understanding for like the black American experience, and I'm both, I'm American and I'm European, um, then there's no way that you can miss these details. So I think like an interest of like the movies from those times and like what was even happening in this country and also what is still happening in this country today. Like this country that shaped so much like pop culture for all of us, like like African American um, language and culture in general, like like just to have like an understanding of that. And I feel like if one has that, then these details can't go missing. Like you would always see them and then like uphold them. Um, so I think, yeah, my fear aligns. Um, and my hope aligns very much with yours. Because I also think that, um, so ballroom is messy a lot of times. And there is a lot of fighting. And there's also a lot of love. There's a lot of joy. I always feel like it's, um, it's the essence of everything that is human, like really cooked down, like boiled down. So you have like the most tasteful sweet, if it's sweet, and the most sour that you can get if it's sour and if it's the if it's bitter it's really bitter if it's spicy it's really spicy and that is great so i think like where we have a chance to do something beautiful is that we are so different and we're together enjoying and celebrating this culture and that brings confrontation but since we're in this culture together we have to deal with shit and i think in letting the guard down and dealing with shit there's a lot of learning, at least it was that like that for me and for most of the people that I'm close to. Like that have been like I've been shaped by ballroom so much. Uh, and not just like as an artist or what I like to do, but as a person, like my political self, everything. And I feel like if we could do that on a broader scale in society, to just be like, okay, I really don't like what is happening right now, but can we talk about this? We need to talk about this. We need to find some sense of common ground. That would be beautiful. So I feel like that is the biggest chance that I see that we could have in ballroom. So yeah, um, unfortunately our time has come to an end. Um, thank you so much for coming by tonight. Thank you very much. Um, Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much to you, the audience. You were very, you were a very beautiful audience, very attentive, which I very um, appreciate. I want to give thanks again to Paris Ballroom, to V, to Sharon. Um, we haven't seen each other for such a long time, and um, he has built over the years such a big archive of European ballroom history, which is just beautiful so thank you for being here and capturing this thank you so much um, thank you to the space uh, to um, Schwartz uh, and Pepsi Boston Bar because this is a very um, historical place for the people that are not from Berlin this is a place that was built 
on resistance, on um, gay rights activism, and it's just very beautiful to be here um, and support uh, things like these. Um, it's very hard sometimes to get spaces and like find support and uh, find places where you can like create space. And we were always welcome here, and so thank you again for that, for having us tonight. And I want to hear a loud applause again to JJ. Thank you so much. For Georgina. And of course, to I Can Stand. Thank you so much. Get home safe, everyone. Um, Check out, you know the links, you know what's happening the next couple of days, you know what's going on. So I'll see you tomorrow and the day after and the day after that. So be safe, travel safe, save your energy, and good night. Thank you.